Titianus came to visit when Augustine was working for the state for the Roman Empire. He told him in Olympias the story of the legendary monk Anthony the Great. St. Athanasius had re recently written his life and the book was circulating in Europe. The biography was causing many women, many men and women to leave their professions and their estates and become monks and nuns in the desert. And hearing this, St. Augustine realized that he had been wasting his life, and he said to Olympias, what do we hope to gain by all the efforts that we make? What are we looking for? Can we hope for anything better at court than to be the emperor's friends? But if I wish it, I can become the friend of God at this very moment. Being the friend of God, that is a key aspect to religious life and especially Augustinian religious life. Augustinians place great value on friendship not as an end, but as a means to God. Human friendships are formed in faith and charity to walk together toward the divine friend. And this is also true of our third order here, we're striving to be one heart and one mind on the way to God, and to be friends unto salvation. In considering what to preach on this year, I decided to use St. Paul's phrase, itching ears, which we heard in the epistle. For there will be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, he says, but according to their own desires, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and will indeed turn away their hearing from the truth and be turned unto fables. The evident literal meaning of this passage is that at some point in the future, perhaps in St. Timothy's lifetime, there will be persons who will not listen to the gospel, but will listen only to teachers of their own liking. For the fathers of the church, this meant those who rejected the divinity of Christ and instead fabricated various errors. Saint Jerusalem, Saint Cyril of Jerusalem said, some preach the identity of the Son with the Father, and others dare to say that Christ was brought into being out of nothing. For men have fallen away from the truth and have itching ears. That was around the year 350. So some taught that there was only one person in God, and that the Son was just the mask that the Father put on to redeem us. Others, in particular areas, taught that the Son was a creature made by the Father. And so those who listened to such men were turned away from the truth unto fables, and fables of the worst kind about God himself. But besides this literal sense, the Fathers also applied it to other situations. For instance, that of detraction, as when a person's ears began to tingle and words of gossip walked in the air. In his Institutes, John Cashin shares a story of how this affects even monks. It's one of my favorite in all monastic literature. A certain abbot Maketes was speaking to some of the brethren, giving a spiritual conference and saw that they were weighed down with a sound slumber and could not drive away the weight of sleep from their eyes. And so suddenly he introduced an idle tale. And once they woke up, delighted with it, and pricked up their ears. So one's ears then can itch for gossip, according to the fathers, even to the point of prefer preferring it to prayer and to reading. <laughs> Augustine has another application of this phrase in Book Four of the Confessions. There he speaks about his love of friendship and how it intoxicated him as a young man. He says, my greatest comfort and relief was in the solace of my friends. Friendship had charms to captivate my heart. We could talk and laugh together. We could join in the pleasure that books give. We could be grave or merry together. Each of us had something to learn from the others and something to teach in return. And all these things kindled a blaze to melt our hearts and weld them into one. This love of friendship and its charms became a snare for Augustine. He says he loved it instead of God, and that it became a mighty fable and a protracted lie. He's quoting St. Paul there. Which he and his friends, he says, were always itching to hear, only to be defiled by its adulterous caress. Now this line is typical of Augustine, very carefully analyzing his life by means of philosophy and poetry. But if you can weed through the prose, it's very true. Aristotle famously said, no one would choose to live without friends 
though we were to have all other goods. If we have all material possessions but no one to enjoy them with, then they mean little to us, or they ought to. If we have all sorts of ideas and dreams but no one to discuss them with, then they grow sour to us. For most of us, this realization about the importance of friends occurs when we hit puberty. Bodies and hearts change a lot at that time, and so it's helpful to have friends who can sympathize with what we're going through. At the same time, however, teenage friendships are almost always filled with drama. Since the persons in question do not yet have virtue, then they don't have the qualities necessary to be good friends. And then there's the problem of romantic friendships, which can quickly become an obsession, as if this person in front of me could supply all of my spiritual and emotional needs. So one must progress from the good but imperfect love of friendship to a more mature and realistic appreciation. Above all, human friendship must be loved in the context of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is our greatest friend. Looking back on his life, Augustine realized that the only way he could have good friendships was to have them in God. As he wrote in the Confessions, Blessed are those who love you, O God, and love their friends in you. When we love our friends in God, it means that we subordinate their love to the love of God and love of our Savior, and that our friendship with them grows or dies based on whether, with their help, we go closer to Christ or we fall further away from Him. Sometimes a human friendship can grow very much, but it obscures the vision of the divine friend. Sometimes a human friendship dies, but by dying promotes growth in the love of God. And other human friendships grow mutual love and love of God at the same time. I would dare to say that those of a certain age here have all had to lose at least one friend that we dearly loved in order to follow Christ more closely. And so did St. Augustine. He had to part with many friends. But his life is also a testimony to the goodness of God who has told us, Everyone that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall possess life everlasting. St. Augustine lost his mistress of ten years. He lost his childhood friend. But he gained Monica, Olympias, and Adeodatus. He gained Ambrose and Jerome, and the Marlonis of Nola. He gained Valens and Patricius, Faustus and Severus, Lazarus and Heraclius, and all the other brothers who lived with him in the monastery at Hippo. Blessed are those who love you, O God, and love their friends in you. They alone never lose those who are dear to them, for they love them in the one who is never lost. So today on this happy feast, let us renew our dedication to our friends in Christ. There is nothing like a good Christian friend who encourages us in virtue and moves us away from vice, a friend who discusses the things of God and the things of human culture with, a friend to see the dawning of the kingdom of God together. For those with itching ears will fade away one day, but those who listen to the voice of the Son of God will live forever. Friends united around the vision of the divine friend, there to praise and glorify Him for all eternity. Amen.